Dalek Universe is what's being called the first full season of 10th Doctor Adventures in over 10 years. It is nine stories, nine episodes, each around an hour long, that see the Doctor pulled out of time and sent back to the era before the last great time war. It really is David Tennant, but it is not a season of TV. It is a season of audio dramas, audio stories. What exactly does that mean? How does it shape up as a season of Doctor Who? How does it compare to the TV seasons? What exactly is it about? Do you have to listen to other stories as well to listen to it? What does the series do with the character of the Doctor? Is his characterization different from his TV series? Before the Time War, how does that work? What does it mean for the character? Who else is in the series anyway? How does a new series of David Tennant Doctor Who work in 2021? Why is it happening in the first place? Where did this all come from? And, of course, how are the actual stories? Those, and plenty of other topics and questions, are what we're here to discuss. And doing the discussing will be myself, Neo from Australia, as well as my fellow Ear Story listeners, Looms from Ireland, Hello. and Dilb from England. Hello. Now, this first part of our discussion is going to be spoiler free. With us digging into the concepts of the series, its development, its characters, its premise, these kind of broader ideas, and we'll be discussing them in the context of information that was released and promoted before the release of the episodes themselves. So for this first part of the discussion, we won't be touching on spoilers or twists or specifics from the episodes themselves, these first three episodes. And so this part is spoiler free to listen to. And then after that, after a clear spoiler warning, we'll get into discussing the actual events of Dalek Universe 1, this first installment of the new Tenth Doctor audio series. And this is all marked by chapters on YouTube as well, the different sections of all of this. So, to start off, can you guys say why you listened to this set? Why this Dalek Universe series interested you in the first place? Because it's David Tennant. And because I love him. <laughs> because it's David Tennant. Yep. For real. This time. For real, yeah. Um I, I always liked the specials era and I've been saying since Big Finish have started doing David Tennant audios, they should play around there more. Because it's mm. it's really uncharted territory for them as far as audios and these sort of stories are concerned. And I, I was happy with uh when they announced the uh the Tent Doctor and River Song. I thought, that's brilliant. I like that's the time period I like. Yeah, and then Time Lord Victorious, and then this. So it's, I, I'm all in for it. Yeah, here, here. So let's get into it. Dalek Universe. We're looking at the first volume of Dalek Universe in this discussion. The first three episodes, and soon we'll get into what exactly that means. But in this section of the discussion, we're going to take an overarching look at how the series came to be and what exactly it means for it to be a series, to be a season. Because Dalek Universe has been marketed as a season of David Tennant Doctor Who. But what does that mean exactly in this context? David Tennant, of course, led Doctor Who in 2006, 2007, 2008, 2009 of the revived Doctor Who Series 2, Series 3 and Series 4 were his proper big series or seasons or whatever you'd like to call them. Big solid blocks of around 13 episodes, those big, very television-centric long-form units of storytelling where a mix of standalone-ish episodic adventures are meshed with sustained arcs. Whether they're tiny little Russell T Davies finale seed sowing, like the errant mentions of Harold Saxon in series three or missing planets in series four, or whether they're more focused bouts of character development, like the Tenth Doctor's kind of rebound companionship with Martha Jones in response to his beloved Rose Tyler being away from him in a parallel universe. So since series four in 2008, Tennant has been the Doctor in some TV specials in 2009, his final regeneration special at the start of 2010, he returned in the 50th anniversary special in 2013 with Matt Smith, and he started appearing in audio dramas produced by the company Big Finish in 2016. You guys remember when that happened? Oh yeah, I think that was 
the most hyped I was for an audio at the time. I'm sure you were very far from alone in feeling like that. <laughs> Because David Tennant's Doctor is extremely popular. And so these 10th Doctor audios assuredly brought a lot of new fans into the audio fold. Audio dramas, like the ones Big Finish produce, are... Well, the reason we say audio drama and not so much audio book is that they're not like a book so much as a TV episode. If you close your eyes while watching TV, you'll still hear actors acting out their characters, you'll still hear music, sound effects, all that... That's what these audio dramas are. There doesn't tend to be narration so much as live, in the moment, performing and ambience and music and whatnot. Now, from 2016 through 2020, we'd get these volumes of Tenth Doctor stories, where you'd get three individual one-hour long stories, so they were really rather like an episode of Tenant-era Doctor Who, indeed. A box set of three Tenant-style Doctor Who episodes on audio starring Tenant himself. These were not like a series, these were not like a season, these were like standalone stories. Stories that could fit in and have happened between episodes of the TV show. There were two box sets with Donna, there was a box set with Rose, there was even a box set with Riversong, like Looms uh, mentioned. Every now and again, Tennant might pop up in a cameo in another audio series, or have some special event like a crossover with Tom Baker's Doctor. But these standalone collections of standalone stories were the main Tenth Doctor affair on audio. David Tennant is, of course, a very busy man. So getting audio stories like that every now and then, well, a lot of the audio listening fandom seemed very pleased with it. The idea of Tennant hunkering down and doing more long-form storytelling with Big Finish, it seemed quite unlikely, given that for as much as Tennant loves Doctor Who and seems to enjoy recording these... He has a very busy career across TV, film, stage. A further complication is that Tennant's attraction to recording these stories in the first place was connected to how these recordings offer him a chance to catch up and hang out with old friends, old co-stars from his TV Doctor Who days. We're on the radio now. No, it's not, it's audio. What are we on? (laughs) Audio. We're on audio now. They can't see how much we've aged. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, this gives it away. Yeah. Turn that camera Turn off. Turn that down. Blast that light up. <laughs> and so the chance of two busy actors, like David Tennant and Billy Piper, having both the time and intention to do anything like a full season of audio stories together, well, it didn't really seem possible. Now, in 2020, and carrying through the early months of 2021, the Tenth Doctor... Not so much David Tennant exactly, but his character, his Doctor, was involved in a bunch of different stories under the Umbrella series title of Time Lord Victorious. I'm going to explore all that in a separate video of its own, but its relevance to us discussing Dalek Universe 1 today is just that there was a load of Tenth Doctor content in 2020, much of it featuring Daleks as well, but it mostly didn't actually involve David Tennant as such. It was more in books and comics and that sort of thing. Not so much featuring David Tennant actually coming aboard and doing some acting. But in the midst of all those books and comic and whatnot with new Tenth Doctor stories, in June 2020, there was a leak on an actor's CV, their resume, identifying them as part of the Tenth Doctor Adventures Dalek Universe 8, the Dalek Defense, and 9, the Triumph of Davros. Looms and Dilb, I know the two of you were aware of that leak back at that time, June 2020. What did you think of it then? What did you think it meant? What was happening? Well, it was immediately pretty tantalising. Like, just out of nowhere, we find out that there's three box sets coming out and Davros is somehow involved. And you're wondering, could it be Julian Bleach? Is it going to be Terry Malloy? Because Julian Bleach, I don't think, has worked with Big Finish. Definitely not as Davros. Um, yeah, it was interesting, especially I think at that time we knew about Time Lord Victorious already. It was ongoing, yeah. Yeah, there was the memes about it being, you need to follow this and that to get the full yeah. story on our Twitter. <laughs> yeah, so there was speculation like, is this next year's Time Lord Victorious? Is yeah. it like a new, is this the new big thing? But obviously it, it turned out to be more of just a, a big finished exclusive thing, so perhaps it's more focused in that way. Yeah, that's what I thought. I assumed it would be like another Time Lord Victorious and would get an explosion of books and comics and video games, but this time there'd be 
nine David Tennant audio is, you know, it's a it's an even bigger Time Lord Victorious. I didn't turn out to be that, but yeah, that's what I was thinking as well. Yeah, I, I'm pretty much the same. I just I thought it'd be some big massive event spinning off, even maybe even a sequel to Time Lord Victorious. Yeah. Even thematically, like, in a way. Yeah, there really was a whole lot of David Tennant Doctor Who announcements flying about in 2020. Forward a few months, in September 2020, we then got this Dalek Universe trailer, video trailer. Everything ends, eventually. Every story ever told finishes in death if you tell it long enough. It's sort of a fact of life. Got used to that now. Across time, across space, I've lost it all. Family, friends, my own people, my home. Donna. Rose. I've always survived, I've always endured, I've always got through whatever's been thrown at me. However much I lose, I always carry on. To bear that burden. To remember them. Everything ends, eventually. But sometimes, just sometimes, it comes back. On the same day of the trailer, we got the big press release that announced what all the Dalek Universe project was actually about. But let's talk about the actual trailer. What did you guys think of the trailer? I thought the music was very cool. That little Dalek mm. remix thing. Like a dubstepy Dalek thing. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, I thought Tent's performance was yeah, pretty exciting. I mean, some people might have issues with what the writing. But um, <laughs> yeah, I thought it was effective, an effective little piece. Um, it kind of set this new tone for what the box set could have been. No, I, I agree, yeah. Because previously, the ten, Tent Doctor's audios have been sort of mostly fun. Not not really anything that seemed sort of to delve into the dark sides of Tent without sounding edgy. But yeah. the more int- introspective Tent and thinking about things on his own, they're all, every one of the box sets he was with a companion and it was mo- they're mostly sort of a middle of the series sort of a romp, a mm. fun story. Yeah, this came along promising. No, this is this isn't your daddy's tenth doctor. This is something different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm I'm like you, Looms, and that I really like the special zero tenth doctor, where he's kind of he's lost his companions, and he's in this kind of free fall kind of a state where his character can kind of veer and weird directions because he's so on his own so i liked that aspect of the trailer where he's like i've lost everyone but since it's not time lord victorious it was like well maybe this isn't going to be him angry and like arrogant maybe this will this be him really sad will it like be an ooh 10th doctor i was i was interested in that uh, what confuses me with the trailer though uh is I'm, I'm at the end it's like a big epic line like he says everything ends eventually but sometimes it comes back I'm confused what the um what the it is. Yeah. I, yeah. I I feel I feel like I'm probably overanalyzing this, but I've listened to this a bunch of times and I've looked over it a lot of times and I just don't actually understand I don't really understand what's being said here because he says I always carry on to bear that burden to remember them everything ends eventually but just sometimes it comes back. What's the it? Is the it the burden? That comes back is is the it like a thing? Is the it a Dalek that's coming back? Is the it a lost one that he mentioned earlier that's coming back? Is it the whole universe coming back? Is it like a timeline coming back? Or is he mentioning something like specific, like a MacGuffin we're going to understand in the story later? This is probably just indicating I listened to this trailer way too many times. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the, the word it really um, sent me up there. Mm. But where there were, there was a bunch more words and much more clarity in the press release, which came out at the same time as the trailer. Quoting directly from the most pertinent parts of the press release here. 
In April next year, David Tennant will return as the 10th Doctor for a monumental new full cast Doctor Who audio drama series from Big Finish Productions in association with BBC Studios. Dalek Universe comprises nine hour-long episodes which will see the Doctor pulled out of time and sent back to the era before the last Great Time War. Here, he finds himself battling for survival in a universe full of Daleks, Mechanoids, Mavellans, and Davros. Big Finish senior producer David Richardson said, What is Dalek Universe? Well, it is the first full season of Doctor Who Adventures starring David Tennant as the Doctor in over 10 years. This time, the Doctor has no TARDIS for Sanctuary and no Rose or Martha or Donna to help, but he is reunited with two faces from the distant past, two serving agents from the Space Security Service. Anya Kingdom, Jane Slaven, betrayed the Doctor in his fourth incarnation. Can she make amends? Mark Seven, Joe Sims, is an artificial man with a mysterious history. Together, the trio join forces to try and discover who has pulled the Doctor back in time, and more importantly, how can they help him get back home? So, I've stopped reading from the press release now. It described an actual series, a season, the first full season of 10th Doctor Adventures in over 10 years. How did you guys feel about all that, all those details for the series when they were first announced? That was very exciting. Yeah. Because um, David Tennant hadn't really done actual, um, much actual stuff for Time Lord Victorious. It was just the Echo to Extinction, Extinction Box thing. Yeah, I suppose people, people just thought, oh, he's too busy to you know contribute that much. And then, yeah, some just new uncharted territory for Big Finish, I think, and David Tennant together, you know. I just thought that was really exciting. And I, I thought it was interesting that they specified that there was now the old companions. But I thought I remembered reading before that the reason David Tennant likes doing the audio productions is he gets to hang out with his friends, Billy Piper and uh, Catherine Tate. He gets to work with them for a few days and it's fun. So it was very surprising to hear him doing audios with people that, as far as we know, he's not great friends with. Definitely. He was in Broadchurch with Joe Sims. I'm not sure how much they had together, but... Maybe that was part of it. My name is Joe Sims and I am lucky enough to be playing Mark Seven. I was so excited. Could I like when we were working on, on Broadchurch together, David often talked about what an amazing time he had uh, doing Doctor Who and like the thing that he cited and Arthur cited uh, and everybody that ever worked on Doctor Who was just how incredible the fans were and that was something that I was really kind keen to be part of. I feel like my suspicion here is that the whole hanging out with my friends recording thing was negated by the fact you wouldn't be able to hang out with him anyway since under lockdown he was <laughs> at home. Mm, and yeah, I was yeah. very excited because I like attempts at seasons because I just think it's inherently more interesting because it's a bigger type of story. Like yeah. when they do their audio torchwoods, it's a big story you can tell over 12 episodes. The eighth yeah. Doctor and the fourth Doctor have had seasons and that's always interesting whether they succeed or fail. It, it just felt like a huge get to get a new Doctor to do you know, a, an actual season. So I was yeah, it's, it's, it's a big commitment. It's nine episodes, mm. 12 episodes, depending on the Doctor. And it's David Tennant, you know, yeah. like probably the most popular Doctor, still very, you know, uh, prolific in his other work. Um, and here he is doing Big Finish with, you know, two, well, one Big Finish original companion. That's quite interesting because... You know, we've had Rose and Marth, uh, Rose and Donna box set, and they've sort of been squeezed into like, episode gaps in the series, and yeah. they've been more about like recapturing, you know, that old nostalgia and the chemistry between them, and they've been fun, and there've been some really good ones, but there's been, yeah, with this new one, it's like this new series. I just feel like there's more ambition there, you know. Yeah, so it wasn't Big Finish's first foray into season type storytelling. On this very channel, we've reviewed the sequel seasons to Torchwood on TV, being the audio series 5 and audio series 6 of Torchwood. Uh, And one of the Tenth Doctor's new companions here, the audio original one, Anya, comes from what was promoted as a special series of adventures with the Fourth Doctor 
in a season format called The Syndicate Master Plan. Paul McGann's Eighth Doctor has long played in more serialised, long-form kind of audio storytelling. But there is a big kind of structural question at play here when we talk about big finish audio seasons regarding how the seasons are actually released, which we'll get into a bit later. But I want to talk now about the actual premise of the series. What really leapt out to me when the series was announced was the idea that the Tenth Doctor would be pulled out of time and sent back to the era before the last Great Time War. So much of the Tenth Doctor's TV series is focused on his grief and anguish over the outcome of the Time War, his part in it. Showrunner of the time, Russell T Davies, really honed in on that lonely god aspect. The Doctor is the destroyer of both his people and the Daleks. So much of the drama of the time came from that, and I think Tennant was really, really well suited to the complicated emotions that emerged from that character setup. The Dalek universe is set after the series 4 finale, Journey's End, so after the Doctor has that morose realisation, wet and skinny as ever in the TARDIS, over how alone he is, but it's also set before the waters of Mars, and so before Time Lord Victorious, where the Doctor's newfound solitary nature leads to him getting very vainglorious and trying to assert dominion over time and reality and the sequence of events. It's before that big descent into arrogance that's been explored in other stories, and it's closer to that wet, sad realisation of loneliness inside the TARDIS in Journey's End. He's sat and alone and... It's before Planet of the Dead, so he's not so preoccupied with his impending doom, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. more focused on his grief, really. It's like there's there's actually two, like, super interesting points in the specials year, and I wouldn't have really thought before this. I would have only thought of the waters of Mars, time where he's arrogant, but they found a, another really interesting point there where he's just really sad. Yeah. It'll be fun now, though, listening to this in 10 years' time when we've got about 20 box sets sandwiched in that time period where we're sick of it. <laughs> Give us back series two, David, again, please. <laughs> so in between those states, we have the Doctor sent back to before the Time War even happened, before he killed his people and so on. I thought that was a super interesting setup because it seemed like it would provide a lot of really arresting and dissonant reality that would shake the foundations of the Tenth Doctor character. And so it would give Tenet room to do something really interesting and for scripts to explore how the character might function if he was in an environment where those foundational aspects of himself, the survivor's guilt, the lonely god nature, all those kinds of things, were not exactly true or apparent, or at the very least they were circumvented in this setting that Dark Universe was to be set in. And yeah, while I'd quite enjoyed some of Tenet's earlier audios that were just freely set standalone during his TV seasons, not in relatively new and bountiful places for Tenth Doctor character exploration. I was excited by this Dalek universe prospect of doing something new and interesting with the Tenth Doctor here. I'd been enjoying how some of the Time Lord Victorious project was exploring that vainglorious, out-of-control time of the Tenth Doctor, so the idea of taking a lonely and morose Tenth Doctor to a time before his actions that serve, that really serve as the bedrock of his whole personality, that sounded great to me, that sounded fantastic. Before getting to the other big primary aspect of Dalek Universe's premise, I want to return to that structural season point. So seasons of TV tend to be released either one episode a week from their premiere to their finale, or all at once releasing all episodes together at the same time, like usually on streaming services like Netflix do. So seasons are released either in one big block together and then audiences take control of how and when they'll watch the various episodes or they're released sequentially week to week at the same consistent drip. Big Finish's audio seasons by and large do not do this. Big Finish increasingly over their years of existence tend to now release their stories in the form of box sets, usually containing three stories now like we discussed earlier with the Tenant standalone volumes. Big Finish seasons tend to be no different. Seasons tend to be spread across three box sets. So you might get three box sets, which each have four one-hour-long tortured episodes. Or in the case of Dalek Universe, you get three box sets, which each have three one-hour-long Doctor Who episodes. And the gaps between box sets of a season vary. 
In Dalek Universe's case, they're fairly close together for Big Finish. Volume 1 is April 2021. Volume 2 is July 2021. Volume 3 is October 2021. Big Finish tend to not publish the specific days of stories being released in advance. Those tend to come as a surprise, the actual day of the month. You just know the general month in advance. Some Big Finish box sets structure themselves so that their last episode, so either their third hour or their fourth hour, function as a kind of mini finale or a cliffhanger. And sometimes they don't do that so much with the gap between box sets feeling perhaps a bit more arbitrary and just down to logistics. So for Dalek Universe, we get the first three episodes of this Doctor Who season in April, the ones we'll discuss today. Then three months later, we get the middle three episodes. Then three months later, we get the final three episodes. And I know you looms have some interesting stuff to say about the structure of the series, especially the third episode here, but that'll fit more into our spoilery discussion later on when we dive into the actual episodes, of course. Uh, I guess the only other note there is box set, of course, is one of those terms where we use that even though plenty of people buy big finished stuff digitally. It's audio files, but it's still those three or four episode units. And so they're called box sets, even though you're not holding any box set. But anyway, so the other big concept behind Dalek Universe, which I find quite interesting, is this kind of tension, maybe an exciting friction to some, perhaps a bizarre contradiction to others, which is from its very initial announcement, the series has been promoted as, well, how, like David Richardson, the producer, said, what is Dalek Universe? Well, it is the first full season of Doctor Who Adventures starring David Tennant as the Doctor in over 10 years. It is also a huge celebration of the work and imagination of Terry Nation. Terry Nation is the man who originated the Daleks and their creator Davros in the classic run of Doctor Who. He wrote many, many, many Doctor Who stories, most of them with the Daleks. So his creations and his consistent style and structures and interests that carried through many of his stories, they were very influential to a lot of Doctor Who creatives. Uh, citing some clips from the behind the scenes disc from the box set here, big finished releases tend to include extras like this with interview clips of writers, producers, actors, and so on. This is a clip from the very prolific Big Finish writer John Dorney, who wrote the first two stories in this box set, as well as being one of the two script editors. Terry Nation's one of the defining writers of the original classic series of Doctor Who, and I think he's also massively underrated. He is a very distinct writer, and the thing I found most noticeable working on these was that all his stories feel like part of the same universe in a way that doesn't always happen with the classic series of Doctor Who. They've all got similar themes, similar vibes, and uh, and a similar sort of connection in terms of what areas they explore. He's clearly very influenced, I think, by the pulp fiction he'd presumably have read when he was growing up. Uh, things like Your Flash Gordons and uh, Buck Rogers. But then he gives it this whole moralistic sensibility. And here's a relevant clip from David Tennant. Well, it's a big old epic sweep weep the whole thing it's like a sort of it reminds me a little bit of those old buck rogers flash gordon series that uh, used to be on the uh, on the tv during the school holidays when i was a kid that, that ran for sort of 15 episodes and went all over the universe and uh, there was all different worlds got visited and here's a relevant clip from mark gatus the mark gatus who uh, is in this as well, playing a character in this Dalek Universe series. The, the truth is that Terry Nation sort of did create Doctor Who, certainly as we know it. And obviously not just the success of the Daleks, but the whole sort of, the sort of adventure template that we kind of know and love really does come from him. He was a marvellous writer. I mean, if, in the best possible sense, a proper old pro. There's something very lovely about that whole Dalek mania period when the, the Daleks were so insanely popular and that sort of comic strip colorfulness which uh, which this sort this script reflects i think if we circle back to that earlier point that these 10th doctor stories with big pictures of david tennant on their covers assuredly bring in a lot of people new to big finish and new to doctor who content beyond the tv show i think it's curious to not just perhaps flavor this new 10th Doctor series with some influences of the writers, presumably big fans of the classic run of Doctor Who themselves, but to quite seriously centre the entire series around the works of Terry Nation. The series is unambiguously about meshing up David Tennant's Doctor with the world and inspiration and influence of 
Terry Nation, initial writer of the Daleks. In the initial stages, when I was working out the overall arc of the the whole of the nine story storyline, I was focusing quite a bit on looking at areas and things within the nation oeuvre that um, excited me and interested me. But there's more to him than the Daleks. You know, you go a few feet in one direction, you get another great concept and few more the other way you get something else which was one of the reasons why when we were looking for a for a universe to explore really his felt like it was potentially quite a rich and exciting place to dive into so to get some clarity on that what i'm talking about here the 10th doctor has two new companions in the dalek universe series anya kingdom and mark seven anya is connected to the space security service which is an organization that quite literally only features in missing stories of Doctor Who, 1960s stories with episodes that were junked and so have unfortunately been lost to time. There have been some very impressive and valiant and excellent efforts to reconstitute these missing stories, but I feel like it's really worth noting that one of these companions for the Tenth Doctor is emerging out of stories that are not fully directly accessible to new fans. The third and final story in Dalek Universe 1 is about the Kingdom family, which is a big aspect of that same partly missing 1960s TV story. It hinges on it. It's titled after it. And Mark 7 is from Terry Nation's 1960s Dalek Annuals, which were books of comics and short stories and things like that based around Daleks who were naturally immensely popular in the 1960s, certainly in England. A butt-kicking android uh, like Mark 7 is just brilliant. And I get to be a companion in, in, in this one uh, with a fabulous David Tennant. The character of Mark 7 was created back in the 60s actually by Terry Nation. Um, he'd appeared in the comic strips. He'd appeared in the Dalek annuals. He was actually going to be one of the main characters in the US Dalek spin-off that Terry Nation was going to make in the 60s. That never happened, although we did make it on audio at Big Finish. So uh, we knew we wanted to bring Mark 7 back. Going further, the spherical robot on the front cover of Dalek Universe 1 is a mechanoid whose only TV appearance was in the 1965 story The Chase by, of course, Terry Nation. I've been wanting to bring the mechanoids back for ages and um, it kind of just so happens that we brought them back twice. So I'll ask you, Dilbin Looms, in a second, but I'm genuinely interested what listeners, uh, people listening to this, think of this. I'd love to read any comments with the thoughts of... Listeners, on this topic, the first full season of Doctor Who Adventures of David Tennant's Doctor in over 10 years, being so centralised around these very 1960s elements, specifically these elements so configured around the one writer. Are you a Terry Nation fan? Have you never heard the name before? Do you love this kind of 1960s Dalek mania stuff? And the prospect of David Tennant's Doctor colliding with it sounds thrilling to you? The kind of unlikely and joyous and bountiful celebration of the show across its many forms and eras that um, companies like Big Finish enable? Do you have no strong opinion, maybe some confusion or apprehension, some lack of familiarity with what all these 1916 elements were or are and why writers seem so keen to integrate the Tenth Doctor with them? Are you in fact perhaps outright dismayed or irritated by this prospect? Does it seem like dredging down the prospect of the Tenth Doctor at a super interesting point in his life, having lost so many, but not quite yet at his breakdown point in the waters of Mars, pulling that down to what you might see as fan service for an era long gone by. Well, Looms and Dill, what do you think? What did you think when the series was announced to be so tied into all these 1960s elements? It's certainly an interesting juxtaposition. I kind of like that stuff with Big Finish, like um, Ace appearing in the class audios uh and it's like a remembrance of the daleks kind of pastiche that was that sounded interesting to me um how it actually plays with uh you know more casual listeners and you know me i haven't even listened to the terry nation audio uh, stories uh, I haven't watched those stories, sorry. Well, some um, you might have to listen to because <laughs> some are missing episodes. So one of your only options is to yeah. just listen to the audio. The, the TV's gone. Yeah, <laughs> I've seen a few of them. But I haven't seen the Dalek Master Plan. I haven't read any of the uh, Mark Seven stories. I don't know where you would read them, to be honest. I know they're in the Dalek annuals, but I don't know how you'd get your hands on those, really. It's certainly like a niche kind of thing. And I think David Tennant is 
it carries it enough. The the idea of him being in it carries it enough so that anyone mm. would listen to it. But I, I like the juxtaposition of really early sixties uh, Doctor Who with really early, since really early now modern Doctor Who. I like the two of them clashing mm. because they feel like different shows if you watch them. Sixties yeah, is sort of science, but real fifties sort of science fiction where it's weird. But now it's sort of more serious in a sense. But yeah, I like yeah. them clashing. It's as if like an actor of David Tennant's calibre and popularity it kind of legitimises it in a way, this kind of nerdy thing that mm. only a s- weird subsection of Doctor Who fans will like. If <laughs> David Tennant pictured with a mechanoid, it's, it's such a weird image. <laughs> yeah, you'd never expect it like a few years ago. <laughs> Coloured by the fact he is one of those, like, ultra-nerdy fans himself. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's funny he legitimises it when he's the kind of guy who'd want this legitimised, I guess. Yeah. And the mechanoids have sort of, a, the past few years, they've sort of become sort of a meme now when you think yeah. of classic Doctor Who. It's such a, a real retro-looking alien, and it looks cheap, and it looks... <laughs> what If you describe classic Doctor Who to somebody, you think wobbly sets and weird monsters that look like they're made for a tenor and that is that easily yeah and it's on a cover with star of itv's des and all it is <laughs> and Broadchurch. weird yeah it's interesting this dalek mania stuff is kind of rearing its head now as well because we've had the daleks exclamation mark animation oh, yeah. as part of time lord victorious <laughs> i forgot about that yeah and i think again mechanoids are in that it's like, it's just strange that this sort of all comes out now, you know. I, th- I think it's partly a product of it's the same guys are uh, writing, you know, most of this stuff. It's the same kind of cadre of, mm. yeah. of, uh, of Big Finish blokes uh, writing these. So I, I feel like it's less a cultural movement and more like there's a dozen or so guys oh, that absolutely. really like yeah. the mechanoids. Yeah. <laughs> there's no, you know, strong demand for this kind of stuff, but it's and happening anyway. Um, there's a lot of YouTubers now, like uh, Dalek, was it Dalek 68, 63, oh, uh, yeah, 88, yeah. and they're making a load of really good videos about 60s era Doctor Who and Dalek stuff in particular. So I think a lot of that stuff is being pushed more now towards, at least the online portion of the fandom is being exposed to more of this stuff now as well. That's true. Yeah, their video is really good. That's an interesting point with the audience of this, because a lot of the audience, like me, won't have listened or heard these stories before and experienced them in this new way where, well, I mean, sort of new, where we look at the TARDIS wiki for, you know, backstory on Mark 7 and watch these kind of YouTube videos that give you, you know, really good context for this era. It's interesting going into story with the sense of an era but not actually experiencing the actual pieces that make it up you know yeah dill that's a really good point it's it's quite an interactive thing i guess it really steers you into this pipeline of other content i think there's a few tensions there i think one is that presumably on the part of the writers who as we've heard tend to be very earnest terry nation fans uh, classic doctor who fans 1960s fans i would suspect there probably isn't so much that consideration of people interfacing with fan wikis and other fan content, audience members doing this to try and familiarise and contextualise themselves with the contents of a story in a series like this. For the sort of fans who might listen to a lot of Big Finish, that could perhaps be the norm even. Or are the stories theoretically primed more for listeners who are familiar with all this classic kind of stuff? I think that gets us back to the tension of how big popular David Tennant on the cover, meshing with all this Terry Nation kind of stuff. And we look at the other David Tennant Doctor Who seasons, and Russell T Davies was obviously a master of popular storytelling. It seems almost like the opposite approach in some ways to me. Davies was so newcomer friendly and really successfully increased and energised the audience, and the accessibility of his stories among audience members was a big, big thing. If this kind of series is very different approach, is that a good thing, bad thing, interesting thing? And the other note with that kind of, if you listen to this, you are probably going to interface with other content is it's literally true in the context of just big finish, the company and their products. It's themselves because that's how they try and promote these things. Anya 
comes from a series of Tom Baker stories. There are other audios that are promoted as tying into Dalek Universe. So there's obviously a wish for people to go out and purchase and consume even more related content there. Reading again from that press release now, the series will be preceded by a special prologue, The Dalek Protocol, a four-part Doctor Who adventure set on the planet Exelon, starring Tom Baker as the fourth Doctor, and also featuring Leela Louise Jameson and K-9 John Leeson. A Tom Baker prequel to this David Tennant series. We'll talk a little bit about that story in our episode discussions soon as well. But pulling back a bit to the actual year this stuff all started fermenting, what do we think about that? The 2020 factor of it all. It came at a really interesting time, I thought, though, in the fandom. Because there was mm. a lot of Tenth Doctor stuff coming out. Well, we've just come off the end of Series 12, uh, and all of a sudden you have uh, Time Lord Victorious, who had Out of Time, another big Finnish audio set. You had this. I think David Tennant was in the end of Edge of Time game. Yeah. Uh, there's been two Tenth Doctors, 13 Doctor crossovers in the comics as well. There was a lot of Tenth Doctor stuff coming, all at roughly the same time. But shortly after Series 12, they're all yeah. sort of weird. Just in the next four months, we've got David Tennant in Torchwood and Out of yeah. Time oh, 2, yeah. Dalek Universe 2, because he's a, it's the pandemic and he's yeah. gotten a lot of work. It, it came across it, weirdly. It's interesting stuff. timing. Yeah, <laughs> it's a really interesting confluence of factors. I mean, we wouldn't be talking about it if it was just the pandemic or if yeah. Series 12 had just happened, but they happened together. And yeah, it, we get this really interesting kind of sphere around all these stories where it's like it does kind of feel like he's kind of been reasserted as the doctor rather than like yeah. the past doctor which is interesting pretty funny considering the events of series 12's ending yeah and yeah and uh, and the comparisons people make between 13 and 10 i, f I feel like um eccleston if anyone could overshadow this tenant mania, it's Kim, because that that's gotten serious press. Eccleston's return to audio. I've had friends who want who haven't heard a big finish ask me about it. Family members and friends say, "Is he coming back to the show?" And I have to awkwardly explain, "No, it's, <laughs> it's, it's not." I want to dive into that tenth Doctor, thirteenth Doctor, David Tennant, Jodie Whittaker sort of conflict of contemporaneousness when I talk about Time Lord Victorious and a separate thing because I think it's more directly woven into the fabric of that but I think this idea of two doctors is icons existing in some kind of duality uneasily or otherwise I think that brings us back to the Tom Baker factor here Anya having come from Tom Baker audios and there being a purported Tom Baker prequel to this Dalek Universe series as well I think that dovetails into the last topic I want to discuss before we get into the actual episode discussions. And that topic is, well, instead of talking about the development of Dalek Universe from our perspective as the audience, as we've been doing, instead looking at the development of the series from the perspective of its creators. So in Big Finish senior producer David Richardson's words, The creation of Dalek Universe kind of stretches back at least two or three years when we were even working on the Anne Kelso stories for the Fourth Doctor, we knew we were taking the character two in the Anya Kingdom reveal, and we knew where we were going to go afterwards in that we knew we were going to bring her back in the Dalek Protocol with the Fourth Doctor. And we also knew there was an, another chapter of her life with a Doctor beyond the Fourth Doctor after that. But that's as far as we'd planned. I mean, it was just the kernel of an idea that was was there floating for us to pick up when the time came along. And when David became available um, during the lockdown of 2020, this was one of those ideas that was just sitting there in my head. So the Anya character originated in an audio season of Tom Baker stories. And the big finished plan sounds like it was to put her in another Tom Baker story called The Dalek Protocol, then put her with some as of yet undecided future Doctor. Although in the big finish magazine, Dawny says, Dalek Universe is a plan we've had on the back burner for a while. It was an idea we started developing at the end of 2019, scheduled for a bit further in the future. But when lockdown happened and David Tennant was available, it meant that we could bring it forward and release it sooner than we originally intended. End quote. 
I'm not sure if the wording of that suggests the idea of Tenant being the future Doctor paired with later Anya stories predated Tenant suddenly being very available to record lots of audios at home during COVID-19 lockdowns. In any case, those lockdowns happened, Tenant was very available to work at home remotely, and so Big Finish were only too happy to provide him with a lot of work, and those two things melded together. John Dorney has also said, One of the reasons why when we were looking for a, for a universe to explore, really, his felt like it was potentially quite a rich and exciting place to dive into. It's a little less clear why Big Finish wanted to do a whole big season so centralised around Terry Nation concepts, especially because they have already done so many stories already riffing off Terry Nation concepts, but it seems that was the desire as well. If it's more clear to you, please let me know. I'd love to read other takes on this. And there's some more context for this in other John Dorney quotes in the Big Finish magazine. He says, in referring to the first two stories of the box set, Part of the stories came about as, with Anya and Mark being space security agents, there is something inherently Terry Nation about them. End quote. <laughs> I might be missing something, but that phrasing does confuse me a little, because... Dorney was one of the minds behind inventing Anya. Anya I'd obviously written before and, you know, pretty much co-created uh, with David Richardson for our Tom Baker run and the Syndicate Master Plan. And Anya was invented to be part of the Space Security Service, which is a Terry Nation concept, so <laughs> of course she would feel inherently Terry Nation, right? It's Terry Nation influence all the way down. Anyway, Dorney also says, When I was coming up with ideas for my scripts in the first set, I thought... This doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel like something you can drop a space security agent into. It needs to have a James Bond in space feel. Otherwise, it's weirdly disconnected. That led to getting rid of the TARDIS, for example, setting it instead in a fixed location and time, the same period as the Daleks master plan and the Syndicate master plan, and the fallout from that, with some of the roots into the story, and it became clear we could have a lot of fun bouncing around the Terry Nation universe. It's almost more of a Terry Nation universe than a Dalek universe. End quote. So that gets us back to how that mostly missing 1960s story, The Daleks Master Plan, factors into Dalek Universe, as well as The Syndicate Master Plan, another audio season riffing off Terry Nation, which is the one where Anya originated from with Tom Baker. Of course, the big question there is, do you have to listen to all this other stuff to listen to Dalek Universe, a new David Tennant season? Do you have to have heard those Tom Baker stories with Anya? I want to talk about that kind of broader question of do I have to listen to, do I have to experience one story to experience this other story when I talk about Time Lord Victorious because I think it connects to a lot of really interesting ideas about fandom and how we receive stories and the modern pop culture consumer experience. But I'd like to get into the episode discussions for this Dalek Universe one soon. So the simple answer here is that Big Finish themselves say no, you don't. You don't have to experience all those other stories to experience Dalek Universe. Reading from a John Dorney tweet on the matter, he said, You don't really need to have seen slash heard either. Referring to the 1960s Dalek Master Plan story and the previous audio stories with Anya. Of course, it's a more complicated question than that. But that's the closest to an official line here. So there it is. There is no. You don't have to have absorbed these other things. You can start just with Dalek Universe. And from a realistic point of view, doesn't that make the most sense? A company would love a customer to buy all sorts of interrelated content. Of course they would. But at the end of the day, if you're making stories with David Tennant, super popular actor on the cover, you don't want to disincentivize people from buying those. You don't want to saddle them with, actually, you need to have listened to hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of other content you may not be interested in at all to buy these. I think it's easier for the more passionate of fans, the more completionist of fans, which I definitely understand, to think that they need to experience all the content that relates to one piece of content. And that's part of the idea of how you activate different customer bases. But when it comes down to something like the first audio season with megastar David Tennant, the idea of saddling that down with non-David Tennant content that would be necessary to listen or comprehend, so really to purchase it, that's it's ludicrous. I'm not saying that something like that never happens, and we'll get into that with the actual episode discussions we're about to get to, but I'm saying that it would be an unlikely choice for a company to make, at least intentionally. And the related big conversation to all that is the money factor, the price of box sets, how much it would cost to engage with all the interrelated content. But I think that'll that conversation will make more sense when we 
move into the second DALA, like universe box set, and it's starting to talk about when you have to buy more than one thing. When we discuss that in the second discussion, when that second box set comes out. For today, we'll discuss the three Dalek Universe 1 stories, as well as discussing the Tom Baker Dalek Protocol supposed prequel a bit too. We won't discuss that River Song story with Anya and Mark today, despite it being referred to by some as a prequel to Dalek Universe as well, as it will make better sense to discuss in a later Dalek Universe discussion for us, trust me. So this is the clear transition into the spoilery episode discussion section. We are now going to discuss the actual Dalek Universe 1 stories, opening ourselves up to discussing their twists and spoilers and whatnot. The first two stories of the box set, titled Buying Time and The Wrong Woman, are by John Dorney. In his words, they form a two-part story, a Russell T Davies-style Tenth Doctor adventure with a cliffhanger in the middle. I can't really say too much about The Wrong Woman, but one of the things I was keen to do was to make it feel like you're starting with a finale. The size and scale then just gets bigger and bigger as you figure out what's going on. There are lots of twists and surprises going on. I also wanted it to be fast and funny. I remember reading something where either Russell T Davies or Stephen Moffat talked about how they would do a finale. They would create big moments and set pieces and work out how to connect them. I realised I'd got a few big moments I could hang the story off and work a path between them, which gives a crazy journey on a large scale and hopefully a great sense of fun. End Dorney quote. Yeah, so these first two episodes. I'll go more into my thoughts of these stories after you two guys have a chance to share yours. Uh, so to start, what did you think of these first two episodes? Well, it was a big promise, you know, the big epic finale start. And I suppose I wasn't really feeling that for most of episode one but um it kind of yeah it really ramps up towards the end obviously and hits you with this big cliffhanger that's very much in the vein the kind of event moment where you everyone's talking about it that kind of thing that Ross T Davies would strive for I think mm. yeah well as soon as I'd read what he said oh it was going to to be a, a two-part to start it and I think he quoted he didn't know who he quoted um he said it was either RTD or Moffat that said, you build the story around a set piece. And the second mm. he said that, I thought, stolen nurse journey's end. <laughs> so, and that's what I was thinking the whole time I was li listening to it. I said, it's going to have a cliffhanger. I wasn't expecting that cliffhanger, but I was expecting something yeah. of that magnitude. With the, you know, the teaser trailer, I was expecting maybe they'll bring Rose back, maybe they'll bring Donna back. Yeah. yeah. But... Yeah, it's definitely something more interesting and exciting, to be honest. Yeah, it's. I was interested how they marketed this because the writer and Big Finish Twitter and loads of the fans on Twitter are all like, everyone listen to the first story as soon as you can. No one spoil it. I thought that was great marketing because this really, you know, incentivizes yeah. uh, you not only to listen to it right away, but to like buy it right away. You don't yeah. want this epic spoiler. Yeah. The, the spoiler itself is like a genuine big big one like that's not like a little oh it was just Wilf coming back or something it's the doctor regenerates sort of the they, they seem to regenerate and it's a woman and it's an actress people might have heard of she was uh, uh, Yara Greyjoy in mm. Game of Thrones Gemma Whalen doctor's a woman exciting big regeneration I thought that was really cool I didn't expect it at all I hadn't thought ahead like Looms had I had no idea what the twist would be for him to regenerate, super cool. For to be, to be that actress, total surprise. Yeah. So, what did what did you think of that new newcomer, new Doctor, Gemma Whalen, Time Lord? I knew Gemma Whalen was going to be in it because obviously I recognised her name and I thought she's good. Good actor. Um, I actually thought I'd mistaken another actress's voice for hers, and I was also worrying because she that just kind of sounded like um, Anya Kingdom, and I was getting them mixed up a bit. Yeah, I was mixed up with Juliet Aubrey, who plays Esther Malkin. So when Gemma Whelan actually turns up, I realised she wasn't her like, halfway through and I was waiting for her to turn up. And yeah, I still hadn't guessed. I thought she might be a cliffhanger thing, but I hadn't guessed that she'd be the Doctor, in quotation marks. But yeah, I liked her take on it, considering what it actually turned out to be. I thought it was an interesting sort of parody of the Doctor. Yeah, um. that, yeah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought it was interesting. I, I 
there was a point I was listening to it and there was one specific point I knew in my head something was up. Um, I thought she was acting very sort of, remember back to New Earth uh, when Cassandra possesses Ten mm. and possesses Rose and there was a moment, there's a line she said and really made me think of that. It was something like, um, all the right bumps in all the right places or something weird. Yeah, and yeah. That's, that's when I thought this isn't the real doctor because I thought there's no way <laughs> BBC would let them have another female doctor talking like that. <laughs> I, thought, uh, yeah. I thought something had to be up with that. She was quite grating and really played up the kind of poshness that yeah. you might expect from a doctor. But I did think she was good though. I thought I, she was, yeah. There was a, it was just that moment I thought mm, something's, something's up here. I, s- I wasn't sure what was going on with those Tenth Doctor like visions Anya was getting because at one point he says this bizarre line. He says, "If you doubt me, if you ever doubt me, just trust me." <laughs> I was like, yeah. "This is the worst appeal you have ever made. I was just going to win anyone over." Um, but it did, so that's nice. It got Anya <laughs> to realize something was up. Yeah. So I saw on the um behind the scenes the writer John Dorney was talking about. He always wanted to do this ending of a story where it's like the doctor's regenerated and they walk into their TARDIS and then you see the actual doctor, the previous one, tied up or something and you're like, oh no. I agree that that's really dramatic and cool. I feel like the monk impersonating the doctor in a lie of the land-esque fake out regeneration, it's kind of, it's when I try and write that down or I try to explain that, I feel like it sounds less good than um, yeah. maybe I mean, it the, felt. Yeah. The cliffhanger was definitely so exciting and you know i even told some friend about it in real life who doesn't listen to big finish just because i knew it's the kind of exciting thing that would get you know even a casual doc two fan or x fan you know interested yeah and i don't think i'll be following it up with oh actually yes. it turned out it turned out to be the meddling monk from the 1960s series of course again we'd, we'd known going into these stories we wanted to do the meddling nun because, you know, we love the meddling monk. He was a part of the, the Daleks' master plan. So the monk, the monk is in here because the monk was in the Daleks' master plan. And that's what, yeah, I feel like that's pretty summative. And because apparently the monk fitted into this whole concept of the series as they're doing. I feel like we get back to that tension there where the first episode ending with the Doctor regenerating into a woman, a cool actress, is a really cool idea. It's very Russell T Davies, like Looms was saying, it echoes back to the Stolen Earths ending, and that it's a huge kind of ratings grab moment. It gets everyone talking. It's this big spectacle. That's really cool. And then we get that Dalek universe tension again, where it snaps back to, oh, she wasn't actually the Doctor. She was a character from <laughs> the 1960s. She was actually the meddling monk. And yeah, like Dilb said, I feel like that's a much harder sell for general audiences where David Tennant's series on audio works as a sell and crazy ending, crazy twist, David Tennant regenerating also really works. The monk stuff, maybe it works as an introduction for some people into that 1960s kind of lore. But yeah, I felt that dark universe tension again with that. It's a bit of a letdown. <laughs> Just bring back everything from the Dalek <laughs> Master Plan. Why are we doing a... Dalek's master plan, 10th Doctor. I don't understand. <laughs> Is Tennant going to turn to us and say and wish us a Merry Christmas or something? <laughs> <laughs> he seemed to love it. He said he liked, he liked the monk stuff and he liked the imposter stuff. So I'm glad that Tennant is getting delighted by this 60s kind of stuff. I love that meddling nun story. Meddling monk, meddling nun. And uh, Gemma was great, bonkers. She's a great actor. I've admired her in many, many things. So to get to work with her was was fantastic. Again, in these slightly weird circumstances where we only hear each other, but uh, but it still felt very vivid and very alive. I, I love that whole storyline uh, with the the, the the imposter doctor that she creates. And uh, I think she was a, a, a an inspired piece of casting for that. What did you think of Gatiss's villain? I, he was cast late in the game, apparently. That's why he's just like a random Terry Nation-esque business bad guy. What do we think of him, Sheldrake? Sheldrake is a very familiar Doctor Who character, sort of uh, corrupt boss. I thought I'd do him a bit like Sidney Greenstreet, though, to avoid any comparison, so slightly fatter voice, uh, oily voice. But he's he's in the long tradition of Tobias Vaughan's and um, mostly Kevin Stoney, actually. I should have done it as Kevin Stoney. <laughs> I didn't think about that. <laughs> Those kind of villains, yes, that we all know and love. And very Terry Nation, I have to say. It's a very Terry Nation concept. The man who sold time, really. 
I, I, I'm in two minds about him with this. Because on one hand, I think oh, he's just sort of the generic sort of bad, evil CEO. You've seen it a million times. But on the other hand, I think it's genius. Because if you put him on the cover, all the theories are going to be thinking, is that Mark Gatiss' master in disguise? Is that the big sub- secret that's coming back? Yeah, that's an interesting point. Because Mark Gatiss has played the master in some Big Finish audios. A master we haven't seen on TV, but uh, one original to audio. But that's not what he's doing here. Is, is he? Because he's got time travel, and it, I mean, it still could be. No, I I totally agree with you. I feel like um, I don't think this is going to come out like a compliment, even though I genuinely mean it as one. But I feel like so much of Dalek Universe one, at least, is planned so specifically about marketing. Like we have that, yeah. we have that twist that seems like designed to like set Twitter alight. We have Gatus on the cover, which, like you say, is what's he doing here? What could this be? It's like there's so much, and you know the fact that it's Tenant, and it's a, it, it even says Dalek on the cover, and the Daleks are so popular, and the Daleks aren't <laughs> really in this at all. They're in it for like two minutes. It's like it feels really designed around, yeah, marketing to people, which is kind of funny because it's also designed around redoing Terry Nation stuff. Interesting collision of motivations, especially since they. They released the covers for volume two and three as well, ahead of... Before the first one came out, yeah. So you got the promise of River Song turning up. Davros. And Davros turning yeah. We're drawn for too far ahead, though. <laughs> Sorry well, for that. This is, this, is, no, this is how they market them. They released the, uh, the covers for two and three so early that it's like you've designed to talk about all of it um, mm. as, yeah. as it's going on. What did you think of the reveal of the monk? Because we've had two sort of, I know it's not the master, but we've had two master reveals in the past few years. We had the Missy reveal and we had the Sasha old master reveal. And then we have this. How would you rank? I'd probably rank it last still. But (laughs) it is, you know, a big moment still, considering this is the first other Time Lord that Tenant's met, you know. Yeah, I feel like the monk is kind of, I don't don't know, it's... felt to me just kind of like oh it wasn't really the doctor it's you know Mm. um a more continuity focused thing and they kind of went a little bit went into oh but it's another time lord what'll what'll he feel like but it's a time lord he doesn't like but we had that with the master yeah yeah (laughs) (laughs) so yeah i the monk feels to me like a big finish thing now whereas Mm. so it it felt like it kind of folded into being more big finishy rather than like more tenth doctory but I, I do I do agree with Dawny that it's a cool idea to like go into the TARDIS and the Doctor's tied up and oh it's another Time Lord that's impersonated him. Like I do think that was a cool moment. Yeah. Yeah. It could be interesting if you met Romana. I was thinking maybe they wouldn't just because oh, of all yeah. Gallifrey and the series Gallifrey. I mean. But I mean they're in the they're in the past. Mm. All right. So before we all three of us move on to discussing the third episode of the season. I'll share some of my more directed thoughts on the first two episodes now, this linked two-parter. So the concept of commercial time travel, making time travel a business and one ran by a dodgy businessman, cool sci-fi concept for sure. But I feel like the episodes, at least for me, they never really satisfyingly dug into aspects of that so much. So much of the first episode featured the space security service agents traipsing around, it featured Monsters Unleashed, featured callbacks to earlier and different stories, uh, more so than, and it featured getting into the mechanics of how the evil businessmen managed to corner the business, but that was all more so than getting into the depth with the idea of commercial time travel itself. I felt that way with a lot of things in these stories, where interesting ideas are set up, but then the stories themselves spend so much time just working through kind of story logistics and not so much probing the ideas themselves and it's not like we're pressed for time here like these are generally longer than most of Tenet's episodes on the tv there's plenty of room to dig into these big concepts uh Tenet himself he very heartily went for all his dialogue he's that kind of actor he always really commits and that's lovely i'm surprised that in the big finish magazine john dorney said I was always determined that you should be able to listen to the David Tennant box sets and be able to follow them without any prior knowledge. The plan initially was for the Dalek Protocol to be released a few years later and gaps could be filled in afterwards. So I was careful to make the 10th Doctor Dalek Universe stuff stand alone and also not spoil any of the surprises from the Dalek Protocol. What I'm saying is the opposite of a criticism here. 
I was pleased with how much Dalek Universe 1 did fill the listener in on any story stuff that connects to it. That is to say, Anya and the Doctor spent a lot of time talking about their previous relationship. And so a new listener to Dalek Universe is equipped with the understanding of where they stand with each other, who she is, who Mark is for that matter, and so on. But I would disagree with the idea that stories don't spoil anything from the Dalek Protocol. I listened to the Dalek Universe 1 box set first, then listened to Protocol after, and I definitely felt like things were elaborated on in the box set first. Not a criticism at all. I prefer things to work that way. It goes back to the idea of enabling new listeners, you know? If you're going to immerse them in this ocean of Terry Nation influence, the least you can do is give them the tools to understand the characters and plots at play. So yeah, Anya and the Doctor's relationship, it was certainly relitigated here. Come on, Anya. You don't have to point a gun at me, not again. I mean, it's been a while, but I thought we ended up on the same side last time. Well, more or less. Eventually. Although, obviously, I'm beginning to wonder about that now. What are you talking about? You've kidnapped me. Why? Just tell me what's going on. I might be able to help. How do you know her name? Anya's, she told me. Well, actually, initially, she said it was something completely different and that she was from the 1970s, but let's not quibble. No. I felt like there were a lot of exchanges like that. Not necessarily that one, but times where the dialogue felt overburdened to me through touching on the several stories Anya and the Doctor have had before. I find that preferable to not explaining the context of Anya or not explaining the context of a major character in a season, but the whole essential premise of it just ends up confusing me. Why is this 10th Doctor season so focused on relitigating a Tom Baker audio season? Why choose this companion at all? He'd met both of us before. I see. Look, it's not the first time he's done it. The Syndicate, that lot I was involved with, they knew about it. The doctor who did them over was completely different. An older guy, white hair, but it was the same man. They told me not to judge by appearances. I never do. I employ logic. Apparently it's called regeneration. It's a thing his people do to avoid death. You mean he simply alters his physiology at the moment of mortality? Well, I'm not sure there's anything simple about it, and it's just before the moment of mortality, but apart from that, yes. I see. The notion appears a little fanciful. I suppose the Doctor isn't human. It would be a useful skill for a species to develop. That's an understatement. This will take some getting used to. Par for the course when you're dealing with him. Does this mean our Doctor is dead? N no, this one, it's just his future. Ours, he's still out there somewhere. That's the thing with time travel, you never really die. Not necessarily a bad thing, but obviously that's not the type of dialogue you'd ever hear in a Russell T Davies season of TV. Maybe not on the TV show at all. And so the story sense of using these companions, especially Anya and all her story baggage, and spending so much of this season, this box set at least, spending so much of the time on this complicated relationship Anya had with the Tom Baker Doctor, the story sense of that never really resolved to me. I don't feel these are stories uniquely suited to David Tennant's Doctor. I'm not saying they're uniquely unsuited, either, but where the tension of Tenet meets Terry Nation has the potential to work for me for some of the reasons we all talked about earlier, I found specifically using these companions and spending so much time on their existing development, it just always felt reverse engineered to me in a storytelling sense. Who are you? Weren't you listening? He's Mark. Mark Seven, one of ours. Way to bury the lead, Anya. He's also an android. A what? I am many things. I also happen to be the Space Security Service's number one agent. Mm, yeah, well, to be fair, you've got a few advantages. Bitterness does not become you, Anya. It is an error holding on to grudges. I've told you this on many occasions. It is another way in which I am your superior. Just be pleased I've opted not to bury the hatchet in your head. Oh, you two know each other. Does it show? It's a long story. Uh -huh. A long story indeed. Also, in these two episodes, the villainous Visians creatures are here from the Daleks' master plan, of course. Life comes in all shapes and sizes, Esther. Stop judging it by your own standards. These Visians are what killed the crew. Invisible monsters. Wow! Monsters is a bit harsh. They murdered everyone, including my team. Is an alligator a murderer if it eats someone on safari? Hmm? They're wild animals. If you go for a swim in a swamp, it's kind of your own fault. The Visians are an aggressive species, yes, but we've invaded their environment. 
Now, in the second episode, uh, I was amused by some of Gatus's very straightforwardly villainous monologues. What are intruders in the central mechanism? Yes, yes, yes. Again? Ah, oh, that's the last straw. Enough playing nice. Glorn, take a squad back 30 minutes. Kill everyone in the SSS offices, starting with high command. He's always fun. On that note of interesting ideas not being explored in as much depth as I'd have liked, the overarching premise of the series, the Doctor being taken back to a time before the Time War, that's the whole foundation of this Doctor's character, well, it got some exploration between the Doctor and the monk who'd been impersonating the Doctor, but a lot of it was rooted in techno babble. Gallifrey is dead. It doesn't exist anymore. Has somebody thought to tell them that? So how can you be here? What are you banging on about? Because of the... Wait. Oh, wait, 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 wait. What, 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 what? It's not you that's out of place, is it? It's me. This is pre-Time War. Pre-what? If time's so out of joint that I can be snatched from beyond the time... Oh, this is going to be a bigger chronoclasm than I thought. Or if not techno babble, then at least a lot of going through the logistics of this plot that Dawny has constructed. Now, the idea of the monk meddling with time and their past so much that they functionally prevent themselves from learning or developing as a person, that was cute. That was a good idea. Uh, and an exchange between the characters I found more satisfying happened after that revelation. We're time lords. Oh, you don't know how good it is to say those words. Please, let me out. We're the only ones who can fix this. It's a trick. It's got to be. No, I wouldn't lie to you. Look. Look, you can't tell anyone this, but in, in the time when I come from, the future, our future, the Time Lords are dead. They're all dead. But how? Doesn't matter how, they are. And I haven't seen one of my own people for a long time, for a very long time. And when I did, <sighs> let's just say it didn't end well. See? Threats? No, I can't let them die again, any of them, even you. And the resolution to that plot of these two episodes was definitely clever as well. It was the Doctor who kidnapped themselves and set up the story happening in the first place. You can definitely feel that kind of reverse engineered style on that sort of plot where Dorney was talking about connecting it all together. And it was on brand to hear this Doctor mention a certain companion. First things first, I need to snatch myself out of the future. Bring me back here. We'll get a move on then. We don't have all day. I could bring anyone back. It mean, just be me. I mean, sure, but that would be a start. Anyone, anyone at all. From anywhere. Keep them safe from the war. From everything. From the void. Doctor, please, the clock is ticking. Well, it isn't I've destroyed time, but you know what I mean. No, you don't understand. I could get it all back. Everything I've ever lost. Yes, and the second you did, it'd be instantly destroyed by the disaster happening right in front of us. So if you wouldn't mind, can we get on with it? Yes, of course you're right. Yes. Ah, never thought I'd say that to you. Sorry, Rose. Sorry who? Doesn't matter. Yeah. The resolution with the monk, uh, well, I feel like these two episodes dealt a lot in cleverness and this kind of constructed plotting, but even with this parting exchange, I didn't feel the actual character depth of where the Tenth Doctor is here was capitalised on uh, satisfactorily, at least for me. And to me, it felt too derivative and similar to the Doctor and Master's relationship in Series 3 as well. Look, I know we've had our differences. Quite a few differences, but you're a Time Lord. You're another Time Lord, and you don't know how precious that is to me. Please don't do this. Please. I don't want to see another one go. Not again. Then close your eyes. No! Also, just to that very foundational level, I never really bought into the Doctor and Anya's conflict. Since the box set itself obviously explores it a lot, I feel comfortable talking about it here, although it is obviously revealing big story events from her audio season with Tom Baker, the Syndicate master plan. I guess that's another oddity here, how this big David Tennant season in a sense spoils the eighth season of Tom Baker audios. Uh, so let's hear this clip about the premise of Anya in this box set from the first episode. I'm not convinced I'm the one she should be worrying about. You still don't trust me. Trust us. I don't think Malkin time-napped me. She's not smart enough. 
but I'm not putting it past either of you. Don't be ridiculous. You wouldn't have escaped Myra without me. Or me. But as we've established, whoever sent me there wanted me alive. So you could have been protecting your investment. Oh, we're on your side. Well, you say that, but last time I met you, you were trying to kill me. I was under mind control. And the last time I met you, you were also trying to kill me. I was also under mind control. Yeah, a lot of it about. I've rebooted myself since then. The Dalek Protocol was completely eliminated. And you, Anya? Murdered any more of my friends lately? <sighs> Anya? Who did you kill? No one. He's being melodramatic. She was called Anne Kelso. And she didn't exist. I, I was undercover. I had an implanted personality. She was erased when I came back, but she wasn't real. She was real to me. I liked her. And I'm sorry. I don't know what I can say. Nothing you can say. Nothing. Although, I mean, I don't really know the specifics of this betrayal. It kind of sounds like it wasn't really her fault and the Doctor's being a bit unreasonable. <laughs> but I like that kind of journey where she feels like she's got something to prove. Um, it makes for a great moment, actually, in part two, where uh, Gemma Whelan's monk doctor... Um, oh, yeah. Uh, ...says... Oh, dearest Anya, I am about to blow your mind. Stop right there, both of you. Sorry, boys, you're too late. Anya! Yes? I've never forgiven you, and I never will. What? Bye! That was like a really yeah. heart-stopping, sinking yeah. moment. Like, oh no, poor Anya. Like, because obviously she believes the monk is the doctor at this point. It's a weird kind of uh, John Smith family of blood thing the doctor has with Anya here. Because he's, so he liked like the John Smith version of Anya when she was yeah. the bad guy had like implanted a persona of a 20th century policewoman into her and Tom Baker's doctor liked this persona but then that wasn't the real person that's like a John Smith on top of the doctor and then it's peeled back and she's really this and your kingdom and then the doctor's like oh I don't like you yeah. I like this <laughs> fake persona the evil alien Zahl made she was she was great bring me back this fake person again like I thought that sat oddly with Ten's John Smith stuff but I guess maybe the point is he's a hypocrite He's definitely a hypocrite. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, I hadn't thought of that parallel, yeah. But it's quite obvious, really, yeah. Maybe they'll bring Martha back and they'll <laughs> have a little discussion. <laughs> but it's kind of hard, like, even if we understand the drama, I find it kind of hard to get invested in it when it's just like we're just told, oh, and the Doctor felt betrayed and this happened and she did this and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Yeah. And like, I'm not, I'm not... I'm not feeling like I'm going to jump out and listen to 10, you know, one-hour Tom Baker stories or whatever just to invest myself and maybe feeling more emotional in those scenes but i guess that's just what happens when you make the companion for a new season super tied into continuity of an old one yeah it's a bold thing for them to do well whether it's bold or they just don't genuinely don't think about how it's going to play to a more casual person they might be so entrenched in their own law that they kind of don't think about it i don't know i mean they do work well together i think um uh, jane slavin is you know She's um, a good actor, and I think they have a sort of chemistry together. But yeah, it's just—it's a really weird decision. There's a lot of weird decisions that might only make yeah. sense to some to big finish. <laughs> Tennant throws himself into these like he commits so much. It's something I love about him. In like anything yeah. he's in, he, yeah. he never seems embarrassed of it. He really throws himself into the material. So. It happened on TV, Doctor Who, as well. Sometimes, even if he doesn't get the best line, he's, you know, doing his best to completely inhabit it. I feel like that goes a long way with something like this, where there's kind of odd decisions in the conception of the stories. For, you know, if Tennant sounds like he totally believes in it, it's a lot easier yeah. to kind of go along with it. You can really buy into it because of him, his enthusiasm. And I think he really gave his best performance in an audio so far in these stories, especially in part two with the more emotional time war angst stuff where he's um, yeah. thinking, oh, I could bring Rose back, I could bring Donna back or something, you know. I guess it gives him more emotional range just to play with that he's in this spot in his life and he's getting mm. tormented in these ways. Even if, you know, some of the standalone stories perhaps are written better, it's a kind of narrower spectrum of what he gets to, to do in them. 
Mm. So in the second story, we get this. Well, good to see you again, both of you. A pleasure, Doctor. In so far as I know what pleasure is. Yeah, Mark. Maybe someday you'll get to be a real boy. I do at least understand that one. Anya? Doctor. I'm sorry. I'm bad everything. People do bad things, they can't help it. Life, we've all done stuff we're not proud of. Me, more than most. You, you don't have to. No, no, I do. The important thing is not to blame people for things that aren't their fault. That isn't fair. You didn't kill Anne, Anya. Any more than I did. She was a pawn in someone else's game. We both were. Yes. It'll still hurt. It'll always hurt looking at you because she's there. She's in your face. But it'll fade in time. It'll fade. I did like Anne Kelso. And I suspect one day I'll like you too. Yeah, I still don't really buy into the drama of the Doctor rejecting a person because they're not the constructed persona he first knew them as. And I find it unsatisfyingly passive how Anya seems to accept the premise of the Doctor being so negative and mean about all that. I know the 11th Doctor did kind of get frustrated with Clara in that journey to the centre of the TARDIS episode because he was confused by the different echoes of Clara, the different Jenna Colmeans he'd seen. But that was born of him not understanding the nature of the multiple Claras. The Doctor here totally understands the nature of why Anya used to appear like a different person, a policewoman, in those Tom Baker stories. And also the 10th Doctor isn't the 11th Doctor. So, yeah, perhaps it works better if you've heard all the Tom Baker stories, but this is a new David Tennant season. It's primed for people who haven't heard a big season of Tom Baker stories, so I'm taking the drama as it's given to me. And yeah... In how Anya kind of meekly says thank you and accepts his apology there, that doesn't work great for me for either character. I, it's frustratingly passive from her. I want her to stand up for herself more and not accept the premise of why he's rejecting her. And I don't know how I feel about the Doctor rejecting her for that in the first place. Like, Dilb did point out how much of a hypocrite the Tenth Doctor is, but I don't feel it interface as well with stuff we've already seen this Doctor go through, like the whole John Smith constructed persona thing. Anyway, it was nice to hear that more traditional version of Tennant's Big Finish theme in that clip, at the very least. What do we think of the third story? The Kingdom one. The one tying heaps into Sarah Kingdom's family, a 1960s companion from a missing story. I liked it. I think Anya Kingdom, even though I'm not so familiar with her beyond the TARDIS wiki and the Dalek Protocol prequel, um, I think her story kind of works for me in that I like the general setup where she's sort of betrayed the Doctor. Yeah, um, so yeah, I, I really like Anya. Uh, but I felt like this is the story where it most kind of hurt that I hadn't seen the Dalek Master Plan and wasn't so familiar with the Kingdoms. I'm not sure if it was meant to be like a sort of twist. I kind of assumed that Sorrow Kingdom was related to Anya already. Yeah, I, got, I kind of mm. guessed that as well. So I didn't know if that was a twist or if it had already been elaborated upon. I'm not sure why the Doctor was so reticent to tell Anya that he knew he knew Sarah, Sarah and knew about the circumstances of her death. So, yeah, that stuff was a bit confusing yeah. to me. What did we think of the mechanoid usage in the House of Kingdom? It was fine. <laughs> did they, they do their job? I, I feel like the mechanoid love, maybe you had to be there. It's, yeah. I totally yeah. buy that these writers love them so much and it kind of washes over me a little bit. Like, I'm not annoyed by the mechanoids, but I just don't kind of get the love. No, I, I like the design, but that's about it for me. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind uh, of one of those weird pet love things. Put in any other robot and you're grand. It's the same story. I think it was Andrew Smith in the behind the scenes excitedly talking about... So I've written written the mechanoids. I had actually pitched an idea for them a few years ago that uh, uh, we finished up not doing, but I had some notes on that and I went back and watched really their, their single episode appearance. They appear at the very end of episode five of Serial Called The Chase, another deterioration, of course, serial back in the 60s and then in the final episode. Uh, they, have only, they have only a very few lines of dialogue which compose of fairly random words really and uh, at times and numbers so I tried to pick up on that speech pattern for them and exploit the fact that in that serial it was established that they were used for clearing colony planets 
So it seemed to me that they'd also be the obvious tool to go to for terraforming. And in fact, one of the very first ideas I had for this series, uh, for this story rather, was to finish up with the Doctor and companions being chased by mechanoids through a landscape that the mechanoids were clearing. The mechanoids are sort of, they look cooler when you see a still image in black and white. Hmm. That's the best image you have of a mechanoid. When you see them moving or, or hear them, it sort of takes it away. <laughs> yeah. Or you see them with any other character. They're a nice sort of image. It's definitely kind of childish, a childhood love that kind of, these are like, it's, they have like certain proclivities for weirder aspects of the classic series. I found uh, episode three felt a little, I don't want to say lacklustre, but when you when you lead off with a, start off with a big two-part epic as it's described, and then the next one is more of a character-based thing, it's sort of, I don't know, I know it's not the final one in the set, but at the moment it is. So it feels yeah. like we sort of we went up and it's gone down, and this is us now for two months. The last story is this more subdued story, uh, and I don't know whether that would have happened if Big Finish still had four episodes in the box set. Would it have yeah. had more time to breed? I feel like even if it had four episodes, it's just kind of a thing with the box set format. So this feels like a three episode season. And this is our big ending. But it's still, it's not really like a TV season, TV season have three episodes, a couple of months, three episodes, a couple of months, three episodes. That's its own kind of format. And so you get this weird thing of, like, you don't really expect the third story in a season to be a finale. But, I mean, it's the last story you're leaving us with for a couple of months. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it's a, it's an odd kind of structure. It'd be like if, you know, series six, if it ended, if Curse of the Black Spot and it made a break for two months. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What I would love... And I imagine there's a lot of financial and organisational reasons they don't do this. But back in the late 2000s, when they were doing those 8th Doctor and Sheridan Smith seasons, where they were actually yeah. weekly and it was like a TV series, I loved that. I thought that was fantastic. I was really into them. Mm. I, I think it would have done really well now, though. Cause yeah. I've read loads of places. The podcasts and audio dramas are more popular than ever now with the pandemic the people like the weekly release format you see with tv people want it bought back like the boys on amazon switched to a weekly format and it's like it's it's yeah you see with the marvel shows as well yeah on disney plus they're weekly i feel like if these were weekly we'd be a little less humdrum about the third story and can you imagine the effect of the cliffhanger if we had a whole week oh yeah instead of you've downloaded the zip file you've got all three of them now i yeah i feel like that would make it even more an event but I'm sure there must be a reason uh, they don't do these. And they're, they're selling the vinyls as well. So there was obviously yeah. some agreements made with the manufacturer and distributors of that. Oh, yeah, it would suck if the downloads were like a weekly release, but vinyl people <laughs> got all three <laughs> on the first week and could like vague post on Twitter about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Have people trying to analyse pictures of the vinyl, <laughs> trying to work out the grooves, what sounds they make. So, yeah, this, this feels like the Tenth Doctor's biggest event and that it is like a series, but yeah, the box set format does play a bit of havoc with that for sure. Uh, yeah, so other thoughts on this third story uh, before we talk about the Dalek Protocol, the prequel to this box set. Uh, so, so much of this story was exploring dynamics and history and characters of the Kingdom family. And yeah, I don't feel like this box set itself had built up Anya as a character enough to make all that feel earned. I'm not sure if hearing Anya's other audios with Tom Baker would earn it either. It all feels so very keyed into that mostly missing 1960s story, the Daleks' master plan. There are so, so many references to it. Like, the story is built to riff on that. The nature of the actual drama here is rooted in characters from that 1960s story. Uh, this clip here sees the Doctor talk a bit about his decision to end the Time War. And you can hear a slow rendition of the Tenth Doctor's big finish musical theme in this. Uh, he has a theme original to Big Finish that underscores his bigger moments in his audios a lot of the time. You can't blame him for what the Daleks did. He had an impossible choice. I know what that's like. Did you kill your own daughter too? Not my daughter, no, but I made sacrifices to stop them. To finish them. Bigger than you can imagine. Like what? I can't really say. Not here, not now. Oh, well, that's convenient. No, not really, no. But I can say that I had to make a choice. Really big choice. 
the lives of millions, billions, against something that I held very, very dear. And what did you pick? Oh, what do you think? It turns out I never really had a choice at all. All I'm saying is you can't forget who the bad guys are. They're the ones to get angry at. Interesting to hear the doctor say, it turns out I never really had a choice at all. I'm interested in how others feel that squares with his TV characterization in the Tenant seasons, and the Eccleston season for that matter, and or how it plays with some retroactive choices the day of the Doctor made regarding that time war ending decision. Here is Nicholas Briggs as uh, Mechanoids. You singed my coat! More of them! A lot more! Sector 80. Destruction sequence. There were a few touches on Mark 7's android nature in this third story. I wish that had been delved into more. I was interested by the overarching idea of this series, immersing Tenet's super popular Doctor into very old-fashioned Doctor Who, but I kind of expected that would be more like immersing that Doctor into the aesthetic and some thematic concerns of that era, not so much like here building up a story about the extended family and family history of a companion from a mostly missing 1960s story, or the robots from one 1960s story. Archie, this is Ella. Ella, meet Archie. Seven, zero, Ella, zero, twelve, Archie. Ella? You named it Ella? Named her? Designation LA-282. LA equals Ella, sort of. Near enough. Far be it from me to criticise anyone for anthropomorphising a robot. I didn't feel so much an arc for Mark 7 across the box set, but Anya definitely gets characterisation material carrying through. We've all done things we're not proud of. Including you. I struggle to believe that. Oh, you'd be surprised. Just try and remember... He had reasons for doing the things that he did. When you look back. I'll try. In time. So we have, uh, to my eyes, to my ears, uh, the Doctor projecting in there. The whole he had reasons for doing what he did. When we hear statements like that, I think, with David Tennant's Doctor, I think we can often read the Doctor rationalising his time or ending actions into those. Because that kind of dialogue is very Russell T. Davies season-ish in that sense. But the actual he being talked about there is Merrick Kingdom, not a character in the 1960s Daleks master plan story exactly, but he's the father of Sarah Kingdom, a companion in that mostly missing story. And she's and he's the grandfather of companion Anya here. Anya blames Merrick for getting her mother, who isn't Sarah Kingdom, but is Sarah's sister and a character this audio created, for getting her killed. Uh, Anya blames her grandfather for getting her mother killed by not succeeding despite trying in convincing the Space Security Service Council to resist an oncoming attack onto a planet that Anya's mother was living on at the time. Uh, the council preferred to retain their intelligence source and not out themselves by using their gained intelligence to save that planet. That's the crux of a lot of the drama in this third story. Uh, it felt overly constructed to me. I'm not denying it's possibly a workable mindset for a character, but like with the Doctor's initial cruelty at Anya for not being a constructed persona he preferred and telling that to her face, uh, yeah, this also felt kind of out of sync to me with how logical Anya seemed to be in these stories. Maybe it would have worked better for me if I had more of a sense of Anya, but since all the Kingdom family lore is, it's not even from the Daleks' master plan 60s story so much as it's from these original characters thought up in this story, it couldn't escape feeling contrived to me. Anyway, this all ends with the Doctor saying this of Brett and Sarah, the characters who were actually in the 60s Daleks master plan story. And your aunt and uncle? Brett and Sarah? Yeah. What about them? They'd be so proud of you, you know. Oh. I hope so. Yeah, and from there I think it's a good point to discuss the story also featuring Anya and Mark Seven, but featuring Tom Baker's Doctor, which is the story The Dalek Protocol, marketed as a prequel to this Dalek Universe Tenet series. I feel it's worth noting the genesis of this 
Dalek Protocol story. Like we've mentioned, it was recorded in 2018. Tom Baker's story is often recorded years and years before they're released. On the behind the scenes for the story, here's what Nick Briggs, who wrote the story among so many other things, of course, uh, here's what he had to say about the genesis of it. When we originally recorded it, any plans for a Dalek universe type adventure were very much in their infancy. And this was conceived sort of as a one-off thing. Although I think David Richardson always had it in mind for the whole Anya Kingdom and Mark Seven thing to continue in some form or another. But really, all I was aware of was the initial brief. Which leads to Nick Briggs writing this whole sequel to Death to the Daleks just because he loves that story. <laughs> that was... and he's very open about that. And it's the mm. second time he's done this. <laughs> yeah, like halfway through the Dalek Protocol, I'm thinking, oh, there's another story called The Exelons with... The the fourth Doctor and Leela. Should I have listened to that first? Like <laughs> Where the House of Kingdom revolves so much around the 1960s TV story, The Daleks Master Plan, with mostly missing episodes, The Dalek Protocol revolves around the very much not missing 1970s TV story, Death to the Daleks, also written by Terry Nation, and a story dear to Briggs. One of my favourite things is Death to the Daleks. So David Richardson said to me, yeah, let's go back to Exelon after Death to the Daleks, but let's also involve Mark Seven legendary character of Terry Nation's creation in the Dalek annuals and then bring back Anya Kingdom you know formerly uh, Anne Kelso in a previous series with Tom Baker uh, the innocent uh, 1970s police woman who turns out to have this secret rather real identity so I had to get all these things in with the added problem of course that this would be happening to Anya after she knew the Doctor, but before the Doctor knew her. So I had to devise a way of keeping them apart that was sort of in keeping with the story and not too awkward. But anyway, it does very much set up what's coming in Dalek Universe. We've talked about reverse engineered stories, stories with very kind of very apparent construction. And you're hearing that list, I think you can very much feel it here. Certainly I did. Uh, here's another notable behind-the-scenes clip on the story. I'm John Donny, and I'm the script editor of The Dalek Protocol. I didn't know it was going to be a sequel to The Death of the Daleks, because it's a sequel to about five things when you actually do the maths of it, because it's a sequel to, like, the whole Sarah Kingdom trilogy of audios we've done, Dalek Master Plan, Death to the Daleks, and uh, Perfect Prisoners, all of those, it's all thrown into the mix. But I imagine that was at least part of the, uh, <laughs> the thinking behind it, because we, even though we've done the Exelons, we haven't done a straight sequel to Death of Daleks, and it does have an intriguing world and an intriguing setup. A sequel to about five things. Where I praise the actual Dalek Universe 1 box set for giving the audience, to my mind, the tools to understand all, or at least most of the lore at play, even if it stemmed out of all sorts of other stories, I didn't personally feel the same way with the Dalek Protocol. For a lot of this story, I felt at a kind of remove since I haven't seen Death to the Daleks recently in real memory, not since I was a kid, uh, if I recall. Uh, and so, and it didn't leave that kind of childhood forever glow on me, like it endearingly seemed to with Briggs. So I had difficulty immersing myself into the world of the story and the events of the story. And I think aspects like with how Briggs said he had to keep Anya and the fourth Doctor apart in the story so as to not conflict with stuff that had gone on in their other stories. Yeah, it all felt a bit mechanical to me. There's certainly exposition here. It's not like Briggs is throwing listeners like me to the wolves. Of course not. He's not trying to have us intuit everything ourselves. Uh, but like I said earlier with some of the drama around Anya, I feel even if you give listeners exposition to understand a plot or a world, if the exposition is just kind of in a vacuum and there aren't scenes in the narrative that uh, straight up reinforce the concepts or conflicts the exposition is about, I feel like it can kind of bounce off the audience's mind. There can be trouble if it actually sinks in or not with some audience members. And also, and I speak from experience as a Doctor Who fan here, when someone is really familiar with a story, when someone's a big fan of a story, I often think that they, or we, don't always have the best sense of how a newcomer will receive it or the best sense of what knowledge they might want or need. When you're so super immersed in something, it can be difficult to conceptualise what someone completely new to it might want to know, what mightn't be obvious to them. I'm sure we can all think of examples of things in our lives with that. And we don't want another bumpy landing like that, do we? Our landings are often bumpy. Not if I can help it. And can you help it? What? 
I'm beginning to think you've lost all faith in me, Lila. Never. Of course I can help it, if I take the utmost care and pay attention to what I'm doing, which means not being interrupted every five seconds by you and K-9. I understand. Understood. And when we've got this little demonstration of my expertise over and done with, perhaps we can go somewhere more interesting instead. And here's some of the drama and uh, alien politics central to the story. You think that is what I have now betrayed, Exilon? The aliens who come to this world do nothing but take, take, take. What do they take, Doctor? Perinium. It is the only cure for a space plague wiping out human colonists. The Earthmen bring great benefits to Exilon, and more benefits will come. <sighs> more Earthmen, you mean? More aliens to desecrate our planet? They have brought technology to make the land fertile once more. Power tools to till the land. We have trade agreements with other worlds. <laughs> All this will bring nothing but suffering, like the city did once. All technology has bad. Aliens are bad. Uh, 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 sorry to butt in. Silence, alien. No. I uh, one small thought. I thought it was weird uh, hearing about, I know it's part of the original story, about hearing about a space plague in the Dalek Protocol, considering everything going on now. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting they didn't cut it out. I guess, well, it's 2018, um, Dalek Protocol, so I guess... The- oh, mm. well, so yeah. Stay- yeah. There you are. So Mark Seven is basically sort of possessed in this story by the Dalek Protocol, like we hear about in Dalek Universe. And so he gets more focus here. Mark is not just a machine, Leela. He's a weapon. And the Daleks tampered with that weapon at their peril. What's he doing now? So, yeah, what did we think of Mark Seven? I like him. I, I think he fits the team nicely. Yeah, it's interesting being introduced to him in the Dalek Protocol prequel. You sort of introduce him in a different mode where he's, well, spoilers for the Dalek Protocol, he is infected with a virus, let's say, that kind of... <laughs> Called the Dalek Protocol. Yeah, that um, overrides his personality and makes him, you know, a Dalek slave thing. Well, the it's we don't even have to spoil that because the Dalek Universe box set literally spoils that itself. It, oh, it, it explains it does, yeah. the story of the Dalek Protocol. <laughs> yeah, so it's interesting being introduced to him like that. And then you get his real personality afterwards. Bearing in mind, you've never actually met this thing before, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I th- you've you've said this still, but I agree. The performance felt much more spirited to me in the non-possessed parts of the Dalek Protocol. He sounded more like this kind of in the behind the scenes. They keep describing him like James Bond, like a James Bond Dalek hunter. But he felt to me like more like a C three PO. Yeah. He yeah. Does- Spock. Fussy kind of android. He's around me as Spock or Commander Data. Or yeah. That sort of character. Uh, yeah. He felt more like that to me in the Dalek Protocol with Tom Baker. In the ones with Tenant, he felt a little more um, muted yeah. to me. His system's a bit more balanced. Notice the difference in his performance, his voice especially. That might be that could be owing to the fact that um, they recorded these about two years apart. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I guess some actors are like Tenant and it's, you know, they're exactly same mode as they were in 2006 2007 they they just get it right away easily uh, some actors not so much especially if you've done you know recording in a sound booth for two hours i yeah. imagine it's a bit harder to embed in your brain but yeah mm. it did feel i don't know if it was intentional or not but he felt a little less exciting to me in the tenant stories mm. so yeah while mark seven was enjoyable in this and perhaps the story plays very well to big fans of or maybe at least recent viewers of Death to the Daleks, that 70s story. I found this Dalek Protocol story overly mechanical for me, filled with what felt to me more like narrative logistics than drama or character beats that would have spoken to me, really. And it's two hours long, so you look at one way or another, all the stuff that happens in John Dorney's Dalek universe opening two-parter, and yeah, one of these two stories definitely felt more memorable to me. Uh, But it's nice the cast seemed to have a lot of joy with this one. Because, you know, I've reverted to being Doctor Who in very, very energetic scripts. It's marvellous. I have been reborn. And I'm avoiding the big finish by being embraced by big finish. Any hopes or wants for the other two sets to come or just take it as it happens? Well, I kind of liked the Daleks weren't in this one much. Just because the Daleks are in so many 
big finish thing so yeah, much. Yeah, I mean, that when I first heard Dalek Universe, I thought, ah, more, more of them. We've been a lot of Time War era, so I'm happy it's not Time War Daleks at the moment. I, d- I like the cover of the second set, uh, the best out of the three sets as well. Uh, it has them, it looks the least just putting elements on there to like get people to go over there and that, and it feels the most like we've really crafted this around being an image. It's definitely quite striking. Yeah, the, the, the cover for the third set is. Is it t- is it typical? What do you think? Yeah, of face, face, face. Big finish box set is everything on it. Yeah, no, it's the second one. It's nice seeing the big finish artist guys get to make something really kind of neat and symmetrical. Yeah, I think David Tennant's pose on that is kind of different. It's um. Yeah, it's not a real action pose like you'd expect. Yeah, it's not so heroic. It's more he looks kind of troubled. Emo. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> emo. <ten. laughs> so yeah, that's Dalek Universe One and its related Tom Baker prequel discussed. When something is promoted as a season, when it's being marketed as an honest-to-God new season of Doctor Who with David Tennant, I feel like taking that seriously and approaching it that way is worth doing. It's what's being asked for, in my opinion, and so that's been the approach guiding us with all this. We'll discuss the second and third box sets of this season as they come out, and we'll get to that related River Song story in those coming discussions too. So there's always the option of subscribing to see or to hear those when they come out not long after the box sets themselves in question. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen and we would really love to hear or to read other people's thoughts and takes and whatnot, so please feel free to comment away. Thank you.